Yeah, that's the the other big one. Well, that's the biggest thing I've learned with comedy, is like what I'm what I'm saying on stage has very little to do with it. It's more like how am I making you feel, and that's the thing that people remember, right? Like it's when they go home, they don't they rarely remember the jokes. They're always like, ah man, what was that joke about? I forget. Yeah. But they just remember how good it felt, the laughing, being with their community. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so just the the trick is to make sure that you're projecting the image that you want to be projecting yeah. more than anything. And what they like in you is confidence. Mm -hmm. It gives them confidence. Hello, I'm John Brink and we are podcasting on the brink from downtown Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And for all those people watching us from around the world, Prince George is in British Columbia, and it is in the center of British Columbia, 500 miles north of Vancouver, or 800 kilometers. It is about 80,000 people. It is nature's paradise. Lots of timber all around us. Lots of people here, about 80,000. We have within 50 miles, probably 100 lakes. Lots of animals, black bears, grizzly bears, caribou, not so many caribou. Deer, wolves, and you name it, we have it here. Nature's Paradise. Today we have a very, very special guest. His name is Alex McKenzie. I've had him on my show before. He is a funny, funny individual, but an extremely interesting individual, an entrepreneur. And he's going to tell us all about his life, his history. Alex, welcome to the show. Johnny, thanks for having me, man. Excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So... For a guest watching, you were born in this region here. Yeah, that's right. So we can bring everyone up to speed. So I was born here in Prince George, BC. Right. And I lived here until I was about 30 years old. So, I mean, I still kind of live here, but now I, I live in an RV. So my quick little story is that I quit my job at the pulp mill. I sold my house and everything and bought an RV for my dog Finley and I to tour the country doing comedy. And that was in May of 2019. Can you believe that? So you went to the college here, if I recall correctly, yep. got uh, uh, education in becoming an engineering individual working in the pulp side of the lumber industry. Yep. And you did that for quite some time and you were very successful. Uh, you were kind of moving up the ranks. Yeah. You had uh, a house already. I did. And then... All of a sudden, you felt you had to change, and yeah. you were not overly happy with what you were doing, and you s were going to sell the house. And then, if I remember correctly from quite a while ago, you had it up for sale, and then it flooded or something yeah, went wrong. Yeah, it did. Yeah, so the house flooded. I was like trying to sell it in the summer of 2018. The house ended up flooding. And then, uh, you know, I was very defeated because I was like, I'm never getting out of here now and ended up having to take another year. It just delayed everything by a year, which was actually really good. It gave me a lot more time to get very like mentally focused on what it was I was going to do. And then, uh, yeah. So what was the focus that you were going to do? Be, you became a comedian, presenting a stand up comedian nonetheless. Was that your focus? Uh, it became it later. So okay. originally the plan was to just do a vlog, like a video blog. So I just wanted to travel just because I'd spent my whole life here in Northern BC. I really had a desire to travel and see the world. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to start a, a vlog. I called it an experiment called life. And I chose that name because I was like, life's an experiment. The solution right. we're looking for is our happiness. Right. And it was just with me and my dog driving around. I had a plan to drive all the way to Central America. Yeah. And I was going to film the whole thing. And I was like, oh, I'll become a YouTuber. But then what ended up happening is over that winter, I started doing a lot more comedy. And then it started going like, okay. And then I started making a bit of money doing comedy. And I was like, ah, oh, I could see the business side of comedy. So how did that work then? Did you, so you started doing some comedy to local facilities? Uh, I was traveling. So I did a bit of touring. So it was basically, I paired up with a comedian out of Vancouver and then just started, uh, booking shows at like pubs and bars so i just learned how to like you know phone up a bar and be like hey we'll we'll come into a comedy show we'll keep the ticket sales and then you'll make money by filling up your bar and you'll get the food and booze 
So I started doing that and learning kind of the business side of it. And then comedy was just so scalable. Like from there, it just started with like, you're like, if you can get 50 people into a pub to pay $20, that's a thousand dollars. So I was like, if I can do that a couple times a week, that's enough to, for my food and gas and yeah. feed my dog Finley. Yeah. And then you just started growing from there. Then it went from pubs. Then we started renting community halls and got up to, you know, 100, 200 seats and doing that. And then I took a chance in that same year, 2019, the Hungry for Laughs tour. I came up with an idea for that. And I rented my first theater in Revelstoke. And that was about 500 seats. And then it just kept kind of growing from there. And now last year, we actually self-produced our first arena show uh, here in Prince George at the CN Center where the Cougars play. And that we sold about 1,700 tickets. Wow. Yeah. And that is on the 23rd, meaning yeah. next Saturday. Yeah, it's coming back up this Saturday. Right and there here. are not many tickets left. So just want to make sure for the people watching us from uh, Central British Columbia, Northern British Columbia. Uh, so how do they access tickets? Do they do it through Ticketmaster? or uh, The simplest is through just HungryForLaughs.com. You can <clears> find them there. But we sell them right out of the Tickets North box office here in Prince George at the CN Center. Yeah, there are not too many left because your, your shows are usually sold out. Out. and I yeah. heard things are already getting tight so for those people that want to be there it's unique it is very very special make sure you get your tickets now yeah and so well Prince George is such a supportive community man like you they think, are like this is the biggest self-produced comedy show in all of Canada and yeah. it's held here in Prince George and I don't know if you could do it in any other community like hungry every, laughs hunger for laughs yeah yeah. So then partial proceeds go to local nonprofits. So in every city we perform in, we pick a local I charity. Like it started with food banks. That's where the name Hunger for Laughs came from. Yeah. But then as I started going into more communities, I wanted to, there were just so many great organizations I wanted to work with. So then it's like this year we've worked with, you know, animal shelters, food banks, mental health association, woman shelters. Um, what else? Are there? Just, there's some that are like, uh, they're like a family life association. Right. So they kind of just help whatever you kind of <clears throat> need. Grand Prairie does that. And same with Nanaimo. Yeah. So what comes to mind in my mind mm -hmm. is being a presenter. I'm a presenter. I'm doing uh, keynote presentations and those kind of things. And obviously I'm very active in podcasting uh, via Global One Present. Uh, I think be 620,000 on subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. Amazing, amazing how this expands really. And, and so I really enjoy it. But what comes to mind with a lot of people, including myself, initially when I started doing presentations, anxiety. Right. Because standing in front of a lot of people doesn't come natural to virtually anybody. To some people it does. Yeah. I wasn't one of them. And then the other part about it is uh, I'm ADHD and I have dyslexia. So I'm not a good reader either. I'm right. a good writer, yeah. but not a good reader. So, uh, Do you ever mess up a teleprompter? <laughs> do, do you have a teleprompter ever when no. you're talking? No. Yeah. No, no, I never did that. So, the, so when I do presentations, a lot of times when I have a very good memory, and, and so, uh, you know, lots of presentations that I do, I may have some notes, maybe points more than anything. Yeah. And, and so, but I have the confidence when I go to the stage and I do a presentation. I did one last week. I do usually a couple of schools the week of the 11th of November, Remembering Day. Right. To me, that's very important. So I did one to... Kelly Road, I guess, and there must have been around a thousand kids there. Yeah. You know, and, and so I always enjoy that part. And, and so, but, and at the same time, that same week, I did another presentation in Vancouver and another one someplace else. And then I do a lot of podcasting, obviously, as well, which in a way is that I have the confidence that the questions will come to me. Mm -hmm. or the dialogue, because I cannot sit here and say, yeah, yeah. now what? <laughs> you know, so yeah. that kind of a thing. Or if I have guests, in my case, where I'm interacting, I know you already, so that's no fear of that. But a lot of times when I have guests that are from around the world that are interacting, 
I never quite know who the individuals are because I never had an hour long conversation with them. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And I have to be ready for anything. And I'm, I usually am, but sometimes I get a guess that blah, 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 blah. Now it's your term and nothing happens. So then I have to kind of pick it up. Yeah. You just start finding like the cadence and the rhythm yeah. of it. Yeah, but yeah. I know it will come to me. So that is the confidence. Where did you get that? Do you have that natural or how did you, okay, Alex, I'm expecting you to be funny. Yeah. Where did that come from? 600 people, 700 people are sitting there. Okay, gal, Alex, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it, I, I like to not think it comes naturally, but I think that's like a, a belief system I have is that anyone could be anything and that you can work to develop your skills. So I always say like, it's what is it like time and effort creates a trajectory. And then like that is, you know, the rate that you're going to improve upon with whatever it is you're working on. So, but I think there's probably some sort of natural ability. I always like talking, you know, it was always fun for me to just sit and talk, but the confidence at the beginning, you are very nervous. Like when I first started doing comedy, I was terrified every time. I remember my first road gig ever, uh, or no, I'm probably not my first, probably my second or third but we're on our way to Grand Prairie and it was a snowstorm. And I was like, I hope we go in the ditch. Like I wanted the car to crash so bad. So I, can, I, didn't I, have, I can relate to it. So I didn't have to do 20 minutes of stand up comedy. I would rather crash the car in the Pine Pass. But the big thing that changed for me was just my mindset around performing where there's a couple things that I do now before I go on stage. Number one is I always say, I love the audience. So I say that out loud, I'll do it like 10 times while I'm standing backstage. I look up and I go, I love the audience. I love the audience. And it reminds you that it's you and them. Are you on say a, that to you. To me. Yeah. Yeah. Just out loud. Not to them. No, I don't. Yeah. It's just yeah. quiet before I go yeah. on, like while yeah. I'm waiting in the wings of the theater or whatever. And because you have to remind yourself, it's like you're on the same team. Like they want you to do good. Yeah. Like they don't want to see you bomb. No. You know, like they're all paid money. They're here to have a good time yeah. and they like you. Yeah. And so that's there, how it always starts in that setting. And you have to know that. Yeah. Or well, at the beginning, that. most comedians, myself included, it's like you versus them. You know, you're like, yeah. I'm going to win them over and they want to see me fail, but they're going to see how mm -hmm. funny I am. And you're yeah. like, no, man, like they're all here to have a good time. You just exactly. have to not mess it up. You know, exactly. just keep balancing the ball like you're going to do fine. Now, the other part is that I'm a storyteller. Yeah. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. That's in my books, that is in my presentations that I do, including podcasting and whatever I do. I'm a storyteller. Yeah. I have an amazing memory. And, and so, and I believe I have good talent for it, hence uh, being successful on podcasting. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes me successful in the things that I do, including presentations that I do. I usually... I don't stand behind a lectern. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. You know, like I did uh, a presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago, 150 people in Vancouver, and uh, there were several numerous different presenters, and they stand behind this lectern. Yeah. I don't like that. I like to have a headset. I like to walk around, be interactive. Not yeah. inside, but I, I look at the setting. I have to understand. Who are they that are watching me? Because I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, the, and then from there, on, what are they looking for from my perspective in terms of what I am presenting? And then I want to be at ease. And then obviously the benefit that I also have, I'm a DTM, Distinguished Toastmaster, that, uh, that brought me to the point that I know I'm a good presenter. Right. And then the other part that they, people will not necessarily remember what I talk about, but they will remember me. Yeah, that's the, the other big one. Well, that's the biggest thing I've learned with comedy is like what I'm, what I'm saying on stage has very little to do with it. It's more like, how am I making you feel? And that's the thing that people remember, right? Like it's when they go home, they don't, they rarely remember the jokes. They're always like, ah, man, what was that joke about? I forget. Yeah. But they just remember how good it felt, the laughing, being with their community. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so just the, the trick is to 
make sure that you're projecting the image that you want to be projecting yeah. more than anything. And what so. they like in you is confidence. Mm -hmm. It gives them confidence and yeah say, oh that's he, a big he one was a, he's a very very good presenter yeah i notice that like if you're on stage and you're doing a new joke and you're unsure about it yeah if they can tell you're unsure about it they're unsure about it they're no, like if you don't know if it's funny we don't know if it's funny even if it's a bad one <laughs> yeah and if yeah. you mess up like just keep going like don't yeah. be like oh i made a mistake and yeah. try and go back you're like no no, no one fix no it. one knows that you messed up dude. Or, or or start out by saying i'm not very good at this and blah 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 and i'm not very good at that i had somebody do that. lower expectations good yeah. job i had somebody on my podcast I think the last week or so, that kept making excuses. I said, stop making excuses. <laughs> you're a good presenter. Yeah, yeah, you're doing said, fine. Thank you for telling me that because I, I said, don't do that. Well, you know <laughs> what I always think of too? Uh, one I used to say was whenever I'd get nervous, I'd go, like, I'm going up there to talk. I'm like, you're not going up there to fight five rounds with Holyfield, okay? <laughs> like, worst case scenario is like, they'd say they don't like you. I'm like, you're going to be home in your bad fine at the end of this. So it's... uh that another thing that i do every time when i walk on stage now i greet the audience like i'm greeting my dog finley and it works so good like you just come on you're like hello how are you guys doing i'm so excited to be here and see you guys and it's like immediately people are like i like that guy whatever he's got going on yeah yeah now the other thing that i do and and again for you if i make presentations mm -hmm. then and, and say a couple hundred people, whatever there are, doesn't really matter, is that the most effective part in presenting the way I do it is pause. Yeah. Pausing, extremely important. Yeah. The other part that I do is that I will look at my audience and I will scan them and afterwards, they will say, he looked at me. Right. Right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that part is very important. Yeah, I generally try to find a couple people that have a good smile. Exactly. And then it makes me feel better. I look yeah. and I'm like, all right, that person's having a good time. I'm having a good time. And you'll see like a grumpy guy with his arms crossed, like a Roman emperor. Or sitting like this. <laughs> You're just sitting there, make me laugh, clown. <laughs> You're just like, get him out of here. We don't want him anywhere around here. But why is he in the front? Get him to the back, this guy. It's killing me. But then you just find... Uh, but but you far notes. beyond that now because you have the confidence and you may... Oh, well, I'll those... make sure that I break that guy. Yeah. Like, I'll make sure that I get him laughing yeah. and having a good time because I will pull, I will call him out and be yeah. like, come on, and, man, let's do this. Yeah, and, and so and that is the beauty that once you get to a certain point, and that's the point that I'm making is that I'm not saying hurrah, hurrah, John, but I know I'm good at this. Yeah, yeah. I know I'm a good storyteller, and I know whatever may happen there with that person that I've never met in my life, and they're from Australia, from China, from Africa, from Europe, wherever they are, we will have a conversation about a topic that they specialize in, and it will be a very good conversation. Yeah. I, 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 I'm convinced about that. That's what will happen. And do you think that you started that way? Or do you think it's because you've done uh, over 500 podcasts now? I believe I got better at it, but I have energy mm -hmm. and I have passion. Yeah. And that rubs off. If somebody says to me, yeah, my you... God, you have so much energy and I'm 84. And, and the passion and, and, and whatever I do, I believe in it. So that if I have interaction like this morning with somebody on a topic that is very close to me, but I believe in, but even if it isn't, then whatever they do, I'm interested in what they are doing. Yeah. It is not like routinely saying, how about that? And really, I... Well, that's I, a, one of the key things is they say, like, show genuine interest, right? Exactly. And, like, the key word in there is genuine. Like, Absolutely. you can't fake it. Like, you no. actually try and be interested in whatever it is that they're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It makes a way better. And interacting in that manner yeah. to me, but it's very important. And that, to me, in a lot of ways, is natural because that's who I am. Yeah. So Even you, in, 
in the street or in at my work or uh, whatever I do interacting I usually that's how I what about interact. the gym you're going to the gym after this you do a, I do you interact there you go talk no I don't sets. I focus on all my business training. all business on the all training. business there you know so you I have a trainer with me I like that and and but some people go to the gym and all they do is talk yap 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 so yeah. sorry. I do that in other places I'm, I'm I'm there for me for my uh, you know, health and fitness, and 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 I'm going to be competing. I don't know if you saw this last book that I did. I, I have, yeah. This one too, eh? Yeah, living old, yeah. Dying, you're living yeah. young, dying old. Yeah. 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 Look at this, huh? Look at Johnny on here, jacked. Hope one day that I could end up looking like this guy. You know, just got to keep working with my punchline nutrition supplements, and yeah. I will. And that's a good one too. And he'll talk about that as well. Because yeah. Yeah, this is great, man. You're uh, you're doing good. And and so what I'm doing now is I'm training for uh, that. Uh, I'm going to be 85, so I want to go back to the Arnold's and uh, at 85. And at, I'm the oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America. Yeah, I yeah, like it. That's awesome, Johnny. But 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 it's even more important. I'm going to put on an old man suit and come compete with you. Get a fake fitness. birth certificate. Yeah, and even the last time that I competed was in 2018 for the provincials. Uh, 55 years and old that they could have been my kids that were competing with me <laughs> but I still came in second in bodybuilding third in physique oh that's amazing and it was not say, from the judges saying well the guy is dead old and <laughs> give him a, no 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 give the old guy a break yeah. he's, he's no through. I can compete with anybody you know so on that like yeah so that's the point in saying that uh you know, give it everything that you got, have an interest in it. It has to be genuine because people well, can Another tell. big one is being, I mean, you kind of just touched on it with being at the gym. When you're at the gym, you're at the gym. Being present, like that's a very, very important piece to presenting. Because I know, like in comedy, when I first started, like you would have every word kind of, I would write it out long form and have every word. And it was basically doing a monologue. Like I just had a speech that I was prepared and was yeah. doing. And... It was like uh, going up on and press and play on the jukebox, you yeah. know, and people can tell that you're not in the room with them. <coughs> you're just talking at them. Yeah. And then when you get better and more confident and you know where you're going, being present on that stage and in the room with them. Yeah. So it's like if something funny happens or like someone spills a drink, you know, you can then play off of that. And people yeah. are like, oh, he's here with us. You're not just like, it's not like going to the theater watching a play. Yeah. Yeah. So... You wanted to talk about joke writing. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So yeah. you're saying in your, so in your keynotes, do you, uh, do you do any jokes? Have you thought about doing any? Well, I, I should, and sometimes by accident more than anything else. That right. Some of the things that I've done, I'm, I can make fun at myself, you know, so right. that, uh, and, and some of the things that I've done are funny, like, uh, you know, so I, I give you an example. So I'm bodybuilding, and and uh, like this one Pretty here, funny. Uh, you know the and when I did the first time, uh, I went to Northern BC here uh, bodybuilding, and and so I got ready, and and I had never done that before, so I got those skimpy little um, uh, boxes on, the shorts on, right? The uh, you know the very revealing. Very They're exposed, Jesus. Johnny. You know, so but you're from Austria. Don't they wear Speedos over there? Is it <laughs> no, the move? Holland. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Holland, right, Austria. Oh, look at it. Well, your bodybuilding. Arnold Schwarzenegger comes up, you know. At yeah. least I didn't call you Polish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, so in any event, then, so then I have to get uh, tanned. So the tanning you do the night before. Right. So I go down there and... Uh, so there was three or four women that do the tanning. So they have these little things set up, and uh, so there you get tanned. And uh, so and and so they say, yeah, just take your clothes off, and then we tan you. And uh, then they say, did you bring a sock? Oh my God! Say sock? Oh. No, I got two of them actually. Yeah. No, no, talk sock. I yeah. said, oh my God. For your wiener. <laughs> that's hilarious. And that's kind of funny anyway. So then you wore that for your next performance. <laughs> just a yeah. sock. Like, I said, okay. I don't need a sock. And so they, they said, oh, my God. No, I'm just joking. Yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 so, and then the following day, uh, you know, we do one more spray over. And then now I, I'm used to it. And then 
the next show that I did, now I'm used to doing that. But right. that, but standing in front of all the people in Prince George, and you're supposed to be a respectable, bi respective businessman, and standing in a little speedo. Yeah. Kind of revealing, I would say. I know, and that's one thing I haven't done. Like, I, I've thought a little bit about, like, maybe trying to do a physique comp competition at some point in my life. And I'm like, I wonder what it would be like going up there and just having people judge your body. Like, I don't know how I would react to that. You're just up there. They're like, no, nah, I don't like this guy's pecs. Look at him. Weak. Very, very weak man up there. I'm like, oh, no, I'm terrible. Let me tell a joke. I'll show you. It's going to be great. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how I would do just standing. It would be so awkward. You're just, ah, what do you think? Yeah. Come on. But, Pick me. But, but you see, the interesting part about it is that, uh, you know, so then once I did it here, came in second in bodybuilding, third in physique, qualified me for the provincials, yeah. 55 years and older, and then went to the big, uh, the Canada place, the one big tent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there must have been 250 athletes there, male and female. Yeah. Every single one of them belonged there. There's no question about it. Right. And contrary to what a lot of people think, <clears throat> the amount of effort that goes into getting to that level to compete is amazing. Oh, dude, I've been trying to get abs for about 36 years now. Yeah. And it is the hardest thing in the world. Anytime I think I'm getting close, I'm like, oh, I got it figured out. And then you get to a point where you get the top two coming in. And then the rest are just like, I don't know, I guess just starve. And I do fast. Like I do like a 14 day water fast. I still don't get abs. I'm like, yeah. I don't know what these guys are doing that they're getting them, but they are the, the amount of discipline to be able to do that. Yeah. And, and commitment, right? So, mm. and then the next one is to then posing extremely important, right? You know, so it's how do you present you to the judges. And you're wearing a sock, and so that's awkward. <laughs> yeah, underneath your Speedos. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, so very interesting. Yeah, so, so the funny thing, uh, sorry, we'll circle back to during your keynotes having a funny yeah. thing. So if you're looking, like if you're trying to add something funny later, like you look over your speech and then look for, because I close every one of my, my um, stand-up comedy shows with a heartfelt speech. So I always start off with like, you know, usually I'll just do some very funny jokes at the very beginning to show you I'm funny. Then in the middle is more storytelling about my life. And then the end, I always close with like a five to eight minute piece on whatever I want to talk about. It doesn't have to be so that funny. So how long are your presentations? That about you... an hour. So yeah. I do usually about an hour. I'm actually getting ready to film my second comedy special. It's in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Okay. Oh my uh, God. So we filmed when? the first one here. Uh, this one's January 18th. Okay. So just under two months away now, and uh, we're doing it at the Fredericton Playhouse. And I'm actually flying a crew out, uh, like Russell AV and Frost Films. Uh, they're flying out with me to go film it over there. So I'm very excited. Wow. But the speech, so at the end, I just, I write this heartfelt speech, and then later on, you can kind of go through and find, oh, where so can you, I add a joke? Where so can there I you go funny? with the speech. you got about an hour. So you write it out in terms of, how do you start? How do you go from one phase to the next one? Yeah. To the next one, to the next one? So what I do is like this speech started out, I'm like, I want to talk about fear, like risk, uh, like risk, doubt, and love. Those were the three kind of things. Risk, I want. doubt, doubt, and love. And love. And love. So then I would start off and I would be like, you know, I think uh, the risk because I talk about, you know, people say I took a big risk quitting my job yeah. to do this. Yeah. And then I say, well, I think the real risk was if I stayed at the job, I never would have found my true potential. Right. And so you go talking about that. And then one point I wanted to get across to everyone is that everything is risky, right? Like we don't think it, but no. even the safe thing isn't guaranteed. And right. I talk about it in my show where I say like that pulp mill that I used to work at, like the safe one, like it shut down last year. Yeah. You know, so you're like, you're not guaranteed the safe route. Prince George Paul. Yeah, exactly. PG Pulp Mill. Yeah. So I'm like, the safe thing isn't even guaranteed. So then you're like, hey, now how, what's funny about that? How can you make that yeah, funny? Yeah. yeah. Well, so that's then the, the joke. The joke I wrote later was that like I said that uh, that's like, like having your safe job, like, you know, shut down and kick you out. I'm like, that's like being left at the altar by your backup plan. Right. You know, of like, you were the safe thing. Like, I'm settling for you. You don't leave me. So then you can slide in a little joke like that. And it's a little tag and gets a little punch. And then you can move on to the next point. Right. So then another one I wrote about love. I just wrote the other day was, 
about how I always feel unlovable. And I say, uh, you know, like any woman I've offered my heart to. And then this is where you do like an analogy. So analogy is very good. So you say, this is like that. And then it creates new connections and always gets a laugh. So I'm like, uh, any woman I've offered my heart to has treated it like a receipt from Dollarama. They're yeah. like, no, thank you. I don't want it. Yeah. And I'm like, and the ones who are too polite to say no, they take it home, crumple it up and then throw it in the garbage. Right. So that you get to do like little jokes like that and right. then just keep moving along. And then you find your next, whatever your next line is. And right. Keep going and going. Right. Yeah. And, and so how much time you spend on finding new things that are funny? So I spend, my writing routine is about 30 to 45 minutes every morning. It's the first yeah. thing I do every morning. I wake up, I get a coffee going, and then I sit down. And I generally start with journaling. So I will start with a, my journal, and I write. First thing every morning I write is my regrets from the previous day. And that came through... I read a book by Daniel Pink and it was about like 16,000 people's regrets that he studied. And it was very good because his whole thing was like, if you tell me what you regret, I'll tell you what you value. And so it's a very good compass for finding your moral compass or what, what's important to you is by writing down your regrets. Cause you're like, Oh, like if you regret something I've been doing lately is that's terrible as vaping. Like I got into those vape pens, you know, the nicotine ones and it's awful. I, and so that shows, well, what do you value? You value health. So obviously you don't want to be doing this thing. No. And so it helps guide that. After that, I write down gratitude. So when I write down things I'm grateful for, uh, next thing I do is uh, just things I need to get done that day. And then it's just word vomit until the timer goes off. And in there, what I do is anytime I come up with an opinion or an observation, I then pull that out and I put it in like another folder and save it there. And then after that one, I then go to my stand up writing. So then I do stand up writing for about 15 minutes and that's me going over my current hour. So I just pick, cause you build it in chunks. So like yeah. my, my hour is built in like, you know, some of them like are probably 15 minute pieces that you kind of chunk together. So, uh, what do you use for, uh, uh, so the, what have you got for, you got something over your head. I have a piece that we put on in the speaker mm -hmm. here. I like to stand up and walk around. How oh, for you your writing? Do? Oh, no, I, I physically type. No, no, but once you present. Oh, when I'm performing, yeah, just a microphone. Like yeah. I like, I just like the microphone. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I don't use the earpiece. We have a guy on tour this year, Wes Barker. He's a magician and he uses the earpiece okay. because he needs his hands to do his thing. Yeah, yeah. But no, I like physically holding a mic. Yeah. Um, usually we use wireless ones. Uh, wired ones are kind of cool because it gives you like a cord to play with while yeah, you're yeah. up there or something to fiddle with, you know. Okay. But the wired ones are annoying when you're on a stage, like in a big, <clears throat> in a theater. Once you get to theaters, cause then you're dragging this cord around everywhere. Yeah, I like too... to do be, um, have my hands free, you know. Yeah, so. yeah, that makes because sense. Because I go like this, that, and the other thing, and uh, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I always use the mic. But yeah, then what you do is I do like 15 minutes of stand-up writing, so I write over top of, like just going over my hour and trying to find, is there any words that I could add that can make it funnier. Should I take any away? Is there a spot for another joke? So they say writing comedy is like building a samurai sword. Okay, so now I'm saying to Alex, Alex, I'm, I want to do a comedy show. Yes. So I'm, I'm in, John. Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so I, I have an hour, and then it's saying, okay, what is interesting about your life? Okay, well, you already know a lot of it. I was born in Holland, the war, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and then uh, was not very successful in school, failed grade three, failed grade seven, three times. You said, oh, I sent him to mentally disturbed school, yeah. but I wanted to go to Canada, and I came to Canada with a suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes, and I wanted to, to build a lumber mill, genius. blah, 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 and then I want to Watson Lake, Watson Lake 62 below zero, you see all the funny elements are happening in your mind already as you Well, listen. what I think is funny is you're like, you couldn't pass grade seven in Holland, so you moved to Canada and became a very, very successful businessman. And you're like, how stupid are Canadians? You know? <laughs> this guy can't even pass our grade seven, comes over here and he's running half the town. Like, <laughs> what is going on here? That, and there we go, right? So they're, they're all of a sudden be laying out this, uh, you know, the... Clip the, out that how stupid are Canadians, by the way. I am... A very proud Canadian. Yeah. Not very smart, though, as you can tell. <laughs> so, all of that, and then started with nothing, and then wanted to build a lumber mill, but it didn't have any money. So, I then uh, prepared a, a business plan, and then I wanted to lend $25,000 from the bank. Once to every bank, they all turned me down. 
and, and then I went to the bond bank and then several times, 12 times, different times, changed a little bit on the business plan, but I didn't have any money. That was the problem. And then this guy said, I go to the manager. His name is John Beams and he is three, four boots over. That was 1975. And then I'm remember, sitting there waiting, he was, and then he I hear, so angry, give, give him the, the money. money, give him the money. <laughs> I, remember, I remember reading that in Against All Odds, yeah. right? You're talking about it. So I, I have a very similar, I'm following a little mini Johnny B over here, because I, I read that book, and then I did the same thing. I wrote a business plan, went to all the banks in town, because when I wanted to start my comedy business, like I, I didn't have any money either. And I had this idea of doing this Hunger for Laughs tour, and, but these shows are a lot to produce, right? Like, yeah. To produce this show at the CN Center, it's like $70,000 for one night to do comedy. Yeah. So it takes a lot of like working capital up front to so get bet is the So where is the cost? The cost? The biggest cost here is the venue rental and the um, production of the, like the sound and lighting. Yeah. So you have to get the, the venue rentals a lot. They have to cover the ice. They remove yeah. the glass, remove boards. Then you get riggers hanging from the ceiling, and yeah. then you have a production crew come in, and they, you know, you get the stage built, you get the sound brought in, you get lighting, you get camera ops, you get an LED wall. We have uh, a bit of pyro stuff, so that that's the biggest cost there. Right. And then another big one's like marketing. You yeah. spend a lot marketing the show, trying to get that going. Yeah. But. Um, but yeah, I did the same thing. I went to all the banks. They wouldn't give me any money. They're like, dude, you live in a van. We're not giving you anything. And then uh, first, well, first, they're like, you need to be a corporation. They're like, you need to have a corporation for yeah. us to give you things. So I was like, okay, figured that out. Got incorporated. So I was like, I have a corporation. Give me money. And they're like, no, you need a business plan. So then I wrote a business plan. And then they're like, dude, you have no collateral. You have nothing. We're not giving you anything. And then Community Futures were the ones who told, who came, and they gave me $25,000. And in John-like fashion, I had spent that within 30 days and I had nothing in my bank account. Yeah. <laughs> I was and like, all right, yeah. you guys, that 25 grand is gone. Yeah. That's all uh, you give me the keys. But I just need a bit more money <laughs> and it'll be fine. And then uh, I showed them that I had a tour on sale and ticket sales were doing well. And then they ended up giving me another loan for 35,000. And then I uh, did that and then produced that tour. And it was great because uh, that was a $60,000 business loan. And on that tour, I lost $60,000. So it was a wash, you know? You're like, perfect. Now I have a $60,000 business loan that I have to pay on every month and I have $0. And then uh, just kept swinging and swinging and it's finally, yeah, it's turned around now. It's So, well. but I see elements of the funny things of being entrepreneurial and some of the things that other people expect you to do, but they are not. Like a lot of people feel that if you're very successful, then you must be very lucky. Right. And, and saying the harder you work, the luckier you get. That's how yeah. it really works. Yeah, and then the other part about it is that the, what I usually say, it's, it's funny in a way, is that I sleep faster than other people is one. And then the other one, in my case, I'm ADHD and dyslexia. Yeah, I got so, it. So and if I can make it, then anybody else can make it. I have PTSD from the war years, then obviously failing grade three, getting grade seven, then going to Canada, have no money, then started a liver mill with nothing, and then finding out I'm ADHD and dyslexia. I say, my God, how, how, how much more fucked up you want to get, right? Yeah, so yeah. I said that. I shouldn't say that. That's the first, first time I've ever heard Johnny swear. Let's put a keynote <laughs> in there. Do, I never do that. And he's excited. <laughs> he's talking about the getting through, you know. It's good. You know what that is out that window there, John? You know right there? You see that? Yeah, Ramada. No, that's opportunity. Okay. Oh, exactly. Now you go out there and you get it, or the next guy coming down the road will. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I'm a big believer in hard work, man. I think that... <laughs> Like that's the biggest thing that's been able to help me separate or grow in my comedy career. Something that's very uh, unique is the, the producing performing thing. There's yeah. not a lot of people that do both. Yeah. Um, it's very stressful. Like it's extremely stressful. Like that is the, but the more stress you put yourself under, you get a little stronger every time. And I'm noticing like every year coming back to do this tour, I, it's a very big sign of personal growth watching myself pre-show. Because the first few years, there's so much. Like I have to be at the theater by like 3, 3 p.m. doing load in. So you're loading the merch in. Like I'm carrying it all in myself, getting all the merch set up. My mom is there to help me sell it during the show, but uh, which is very lucky. That's one of the best parts of this thing is I get to now tour the world with yeah. my mom. But 
where you're like loading merch in and then you're meeting with a tech crew and then you're loading up like the slides. You're like, we have a pre-show slideshow. We've got slides for all the performers. There's all these different cues for when like on and off music, lighting, um, and you're doing all of that. And then it's like, okay, doors are opening and you get like a 20 minute window maybe where I'm like, okay, now I have to think about the performance. Yeah. Now it's like get ready to actually yeah. perform and being able to switch from that producer to performer mode is very difficult. And especially, I remember like there's been some shows where like some of those shows early on, I was saying like, I've lost $10,000 in a night trying yeah. to do a comedy show. Yeah. And then you still have to go on that stage and perform and, and you're be like funny yes and you're and, the, and make it believable yeah yeah exactly not just up there crying you want to cry yeah and the big thing is they say like a uh, good one i learned was like don't get mad at the people who showed up for the people who didn't exactly so it was like because a lot of you've seen comedians or i've seen comedians in the past and they come here and they're like oh yeah 80 you showed up thanks for really coming out tonight guys you really did it you know and it's like, don't get mad at them. They're the eight that did come. You exactly. know, they paid and they're here. Don't yeah. get mad at them for the people that didn't. Exactly. You know, so then, yeah. Uh, but yeah, learning that. I just really think, like, running a business is something that has really changed me and I think for the better. It's made me have a way better understanding of the world. It's made me a way stronger person. Um, I've had to, you know, you're constantly overcoming obstacles and problems. And there's actually a really good Tony Robbins quote that I, uh, I really like. I really like motivational speaking. Yeah, yeah. And he has this one quote, and it, it's so great. But he says, because uh, all the time I'm like, oh, there's a problem with this. Oh, the, this light's not working. Or, oh, we missed this. Or just, just problems. And you're like, when are these going to stop? And his quote is, I can tell you what your biggest problem is, and it's that you don't think you should have any. No, exactly. And then once you realize life is basically a series of problem solving and you get to pick which problems are worth solving, yeah. you know, and you're like, oh, well, is this one like you want to have a good family and a good marriage? Yeah. Well, it's like, well, that's a good problem to try and figure out. Right. right. So then then you're like, oh, well, how do I have a successful marriage? Or, you know, I want to have a fulfilling career. Well, that's a problem. It's worth solving. Right. And then there's other problems that you're like, ah, you know, that's not worth figuring out like, uh, how do I get a, a, a jet ski? And you're like, ah, I don't know if it's worth putting that much time into getting that. Like, you know the one that kills me? When I see my friends all doing renos. Like, I, I cannot stand renovations, because I probably because I renovated my house when I got it, but I'll watch them, and it'll take them like six months of their year to do like a kitchen reno. They're like planning the countertops, they're planning this and that, and they're ripping stuff out, and they're doing it all. And it, like, I, I think it must come out of, first of all, I think men just need to have projects to work on. They're yeah. like, I just got to do something. Yeah. But it just must come out of like boredom of not having something else you're going after. Because right. at the end of it, I go, you still just have a kitchen. Yeah. And that was six months of your life and $30,000. Yeah. Where I'm exactly. like, well, if you spent six months like developing a skill or working on, you know, something or building a business, I don't know. I always resort to business now, but yeah. So what I think is that, uh, you know, particular entrepreneurship and especially looking at things and, and exposing yourself to challenges and stress likely will make your life potentially even more funnier and more attractive to other people watching you because of that and that experience in particular is not only gives information but if you can make that at the same time, in a way, identifying the interesting, funny steps along the way yeah. that makes it interesting, I believe. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, there's nothing funnier than failure, right? Like watching someone fail, oh, it's so funny. That's yeah. what they say. What is the um, like benign violation theory? That's like a good joke writing theory. Yeah. And that's basically, you just take like any kind of violation and then find a way to make it okay. Right. So that's why they say it's like funny when someone falls down a flight of stairs, you yeah. know, as long as they get up because then they're okay. Like yeah. if they're hurt, you're like, oh, this isn't funny. But yeah. if they get up, you're like, ah, you idiot. Then it's hilarious. So I find that in life. You know what? It's um, the other one. They say that like, uh, like, like likability is confidence plus humility. Yeah. So it's like you're, you're extremely confident, but you're humble about it. And, and that, that's seems, to be, that yeah. seems to be the formula for likability. So it's like yeah. if you can go on stage, <clears throat> like I talk about my lisp on stage and do jokes about that and it's like oh here's this vulnerability or this thing that would be like a weakness right um but you can talk about it confidently and how it's silly and funny 
And then that just makes you so much more likable when you can talk about your shortcomings. Exactly. And then people are like, yeah, I like this guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he is, he is normal just like all of us, right? In yeah. A way. But to create that confidence and to become a good presenter and a good effective communicator is a real challenge because it's really not taught I, in our schools. Yeah, I, I don't think you get, yeah. The, well, a the weird one that I think a lot of the time we're like building kids' egos more than we're building their confidence, you know? Right. Like you're telling kids just how good they are all the time and stuff. Right. And I mean, I don't mean to sound old man by saying kids, like I got the same thing. You know, my parents are just constantly telling me, oh, you're great, you're doing good. And it just builds your ego rather than your actual self-esteem. Yeah. But I think that's the thing, like, self-esteem it's esteem of self like it's something that only you can build for you right. so it's your image of yourself and the way that i found that i think it's just by doing the things that you say you're gonna do you know and like holding true to yourself so like i notice my confidence goes up when i stick to my routine like when i wake up and i do my journaling i do my joke writing i post a joke on tiktok i go to the gym i eat healthy i perform you're like, okay, you're, you're doing the things that you know you should be. And then I go, oh, I'm someone who, you know, has discipline. And then I start believing that about myself. Yeah. Is where I don't think you can get confident. I don't know any other way to get confidence, actually. But, but you have discipline because you say you got the journal. You get up first thing in the morning. You're going to spend 45 minutes or whatever time mm -hmm. you spend on thinking about and, and, and funny things to... Or, or explore opportunities. The other part that I heard you say, and I saw it in your bio as well, TikTok. So what does that do for you? Do you test some of your funny things on TikTok? Yeah, so See, TikTok was, it kind of, how it started for me was over COVID. Because, like, I quit my job at the worst time, John. Yeah. Like, you could, not, you could not have timed this better. Like, it was, like, May of 2019 that I'm like, I'm quitting my job to become a comedian. Yeah. And then it was less than a year later. They're like, by the way, it's illegal to do comedy. Stay inside. Go home. You're like, well, I don't have one. I sold mine. They're like, perfect. You're back in your parents' basement. And by the way, your house, it's now worth double what you sold it for because we had the biggest housing increase. And you're like, oh, my God. Like, I could not have timed this thing worse. Yeah. Um, but I still would have done it 100% to this day. Because if I didn't, like if I, I'm so lucky I did. Because had COVID come, I wouldn't have quit during COVID. No. And then it would have been a few more years down the road. And then I don't know if I ever would have quit. No. But what ended up happening was TikTok, because I couldn't perform. I was like, well, I better use all of this time. And I, I was learning, like I was telling you, I was doing the producing and performing. So I was phoning, booking shows, doing that. So it was very time consuming. So it was very hard to develop new material in the beginning because I was so busy trying to just get the business side sorted. Um, but once I got that, like once that got taken away, the business side, I was like, well, I'll use all of COVID to learn how to write jokes. So I just started writing jokes every day. I would write, try to write five a day. And then I would pick what one I thought was the funniest and I'd put it online. And within a few weeks, they started going viral. I started getting a couple hundred thousand views on videos. Oh my. Got up to the, you know, then started getting into the millions. The most viewed video I think has like over 30 million views. So we got some pretty good ones. Um, but yeah, it just became, I don't know if it's really a joke testing area as much as now it's, uh, it's just a fun thing and a way to stay relevant. Like you, you need to be out there on social media so much now. You have to be posting almost every day. Yeah. And it's really good for awareness. Like a lot of the time people will see those jokes and then later on they'll then see that you're coming to their town to do a show. Right. And they're like, oh, I saw this guy's joke on TikTok. Yeah. And then they'll, that'll convert to ticket sales and yeah. get people out at your show. So yeah. it's more just like a constant raising awareness thing that you're trying to do with your jokes on there. And then it is a good litmus test for like, you know, if a joke goes really viral, you're like, oh, that strikes a chord. But the biggest problem I'm finding, this is like a, a real issue I have in my career that I have to make a decision on soon, is my TikTok is very different from my stand-up. So like my TikTok, a lot of time those one-liner jokes, they're short, they're punchy, and they have a shock factor. So a lot of the time it'll be like a dirty joke, you know, with some sort of sex connotation, or you're, you know, it's just... Uh, kind of a shocking, you know, you're like swearing or something to kind of get like that good. Cause you're just doing ba bump, ba bump, and it's got a big, it's gotta be punchy 15 seconds, trying to be quick. Um, 
but my stand up is very, for the most part, it's a very clean act. You know, I'm talking about my family and, you know, my sister and brother and living in the RV with my dog. And it's, um, it's very different from the TikToks that I put out. But what I am seeing in some of my marketing, people will go to my page and they're like, I don't want to watch an hour of this. Like they think you're just going to be up there doing, you know, dirty jokes. And they're like, I don't want to watch that. But then your stand up is very different from that. So I yeah. don't know. The only issue is you get so many views from those TikToks. Like if I put out my stand up, yeah. uh, the long form stuff, people don't watch it. It's just too long. They're like, I don't want to sit here for three minutes and listen to this guy tell this thing, you know? Yeah. So the interesting part about it is what you have is marketing Alexander McKenzie. Yeah. You know, Alex McKenzie, that's what I do in my books. Right? Yeah, you're marketing Johnny B. So I initially, I need to, in the same as that book, I need to have my name on there in big letters because that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. John A. Brink. And then. Can you put my name on the next one? <laughs> yeah. Help me get some marketing there. <laughs> and then the other thing that I do from a marketing perspective is I'm good at podcasting. And so. Uh, you know, 620,000 subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. Um, amazing. That's Even to myself, it's saying amazing. So, as you are doing... I do think that this is the trick. So, this is something that I'm writing down. This is going to be one of my 2025 20, goals is to increase my podcast. So, that vlog I talked about, An Experiment Called Life, that basically became a podcast now. It used to be right. a video blog. I would film all, like, all day, you know, get eight hours of content for the week. Every Sunday I would sit down, cut it down to 30 minutes and then put out like a video blog of my travels. But now it's basically become just a short podcast where I sit in front of my camera and talk for 10 or 15 minutes about how I'm feeling. Exactly. The only thing, I don't do it near enough. Like I'm doing maybe one a month at most right, right now. And I do think that this is the, the difference. Like because the short form, the jokes, those type of things, they get people's attention right. and it gets you noticed. But people fall in love with you for your character and who you are. And right. I think that this, having these long form conversations, this is the best way to get that across to people. You know, like you get to hear someone speak loosely for a look any period of time. You can really get a feel for who someone is. So what I do, I do an hour mm -hmm. and we do it persistently. We do usually up to six a week where we do maybe four podcasts, two where or four where I'm a host to where I'm a guest or something around there. Yeah. And, and so, uh, and we do it all the time. We are predictable and, and the conversations are going from one topic to the extreme other ones. I never know what will happen next, but I don't obviously know how you do it, John. it works for us. It raises the profile of on the brink. Yeah. hundred percent. And then the other part of, about it, uh, you know, we have millions of viewers. Yeah. So there must be something that we are doing right. And that's exactly what you're doing in the way is looking at the marketing side of this and saying the next step that I want to do is do a platform. And, and so that's what uh, we are working on right now. And we'll probably start that early in 2025. What do you mean by a platform? Platform, I would say that it uh, is like not like Facebook, but something like that model. Okay. You know, Facebook uh, and, and some of the other ones uh, that they have, where we consistently are on, available, and we bring in other expertise. May it be ADHD, may it be uh, physical fitness, may it be diet, may it be quality of life issues, long levity, mm -hmm. all the things that I write about and challenges that people may have, maybe depression, anxiety, all those issues. Mm -hmm. Do you take a longevity? Do you take anything for longevity? Like do you take any supplements for that? Like I was taking uh, this thing they called NAD, like an NAD precursor. I don't know. Uh, you know, my, my wife has some of these things, healthy things, not supplements, meaning steroids or anything like that but uh yeah, are you on steroids john no did you tell me i won't tell anyone don't worry 
No, I'm not actually. You know, the I'm, I'm not a believer. <laughs> no, I'm in not. And, and, you know, but I try to stay healthy. You know, and fit. You know, yeah, so yeah. and uh, you know, but uh, I'm interested in longevity, obviously, for all the reasons that I I'm doing. I it. read a really good book. I think we might even talked about it last time. Was uh, it's called Lifespan by David Sinclair. Okay, and it's why we age and why we don't have to. And right. he basically, they've figured out aging and he's just kind of explaining what aging is. And then he talks about things that they found that increase um, your longevity. Yeah. But there, there's some pretty good supplements out there now. Like there's that NAD stuff in mice anyway. It's been shown to make them live 30% longer. Yeah. Which is like, that's a substantial amount. You could live to be 150, John. You get on this stuff. I'm yeah. telling you. You know, 30% longer. <laughs> I don't know if I'm on the live to 150. <laughs> so that. now the other thing... Now you're entrepreneurial and you got this one here. Yeah. And tell us about that. Yeah, so I started uh, Punchline Nutrition. So it was, uh, you know, I wanted to start a second business. I just uh, yeah. had so much fun starting the first one. And originally I was trying to figure out what, you know, what is something that I wanted to sell. And I honestly, I started out with a, I was doing like a beauty thing for a while. Right. And I just realized you're like, it's, I was trying to sell LED face masks. And the problem is you have to make a new, you have to make like a new Facebook account, new Instagram account, and then you start running marketing campaigns. And then like, it's very difficult because even if people go to the website and they see it, they go, this thing has two followers. I don't trust it. It's probably a scam. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, I need something that I will put my face, like that I'll put right. Alex McKenzie will right. stand behind. And I'm like, I don't know LED face masks. Like I don't, I would never use one. I don't no. know the point. But supplements are something I've been taking for 20 years now. And yeah. I, like, I just love them. I really believe in them. I think they're great. Health and fitness is another thing that I like to do. So this one here is it's a powder. Yeah, that's a BCAA, some branch chain amino acids. Okay. And, and so what you do is you take a scoop of it. Yeah. And I think you scoop, got some in your cup there. Yeah, I have some here. Scott makes some, some, up some. So you take a scoop of it. That's a, that's a problem we have with those containers. You see how far the scoop is I down? Can't, I you can't, can't get the scoop, right? Yeah, I can't, can't get I know. Scoop. Let me see. That's the thing. Dude, they suck. It's like way in there. I noticed that. You got too big of hands, John, I from do. all you're working out. I so do. here here you go. You can get yourself a scoop. Okay, now what you want to do is just want to fire this right in your mouth, okay? Huh? <laughs> can <No>. you imagine? <laughs> what was it <laughs> I have it in here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is You like, don't want to put it right in your mouth, right? No, no, don't put it right in your mouth. That's just, I'm not messing with you. Say, oh my God, saying, what happened to John? He's in the hospital. He got, <laughs> he, he got too many of the, the healthy it's things. Too much of a good thing this guy's got going on. Yeah. So and I then started, some people would say, oh, well, that's a good thing. No, it is. No, no, no. <laughs> no one's wishing, wishing well, wishing yeah. ill will on you. Um, but yes, yeah, so I started. It tastes good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I yeah. like it. It's. Uh, Started, it's like punchline nutrition. So I thought it was kind of on brand with, you know, comedy, yeah. punchline. And then uh, I, what's our, our little catchphrase? It's like, whether it's uh, stand up comedy or physical fitness, right. I'm like, you can have the perfect setup, but it means nothing without the right punchline. Yeah. So something I've even noticed in my fitness journey, as all the people say, because we're on a journey and yeah. that's what we're doing. Uh, in my fitness journey, I found. I, I was training for a long time and the training was fine, but I wasn't giving my body the right stuff to right. grow. Right. And then as soon as I started, you know, like really getting enough protein, I started taking creatine, you know, good pre-workout. And uh, I really started noticing the results were coming a lot quicker right. than they had in the past. So it's very important to be able to give your body those things. And I mean, you probably can get most of it through food. That's why I'm a bad salesman. I'm like, I don't know if you need this stuff, but I like it and I do find it helps. But well, my wife would like it. What she wouldn't like about it is that, do I have to take it to a straw? No, you don't have to take it to a so straw. So I thought the straw came with it because you will say, is the straw plastic or is it paper? Yeah, how many turtles are you killing over there, John? What is that? That looks, that looks paper. I wouldn't. I, I like that, actually. You like yeah. the paper? Well, yeah. of course my, you do. My wife right? says, no plastic. And obviously, I sell lumber. Yeah, you know, exactly. So that makes straws. sense. But I, an interesting taste. Yeah, yeah. There's... Um, Another one, well, my favorite product that we have is this thing called NeuroBoost. So it's a nootropic. So okay. I started taking those quite a while ago, but it's basically like a multivitamin for your brain. Okay. And I take them before I perform. I took them before this podcast. Should have brought some down for you. Yeah. I can bring you some NeuroBoost, but it's like, uh, yeah, multivitamin for your brain. I find it makes me way sharper. Like you're just, uh, when I'm looking for words, they show up quicker. I'm more, 
nimble on my feet in my brain. If that's a sentence, I don't know. But Interesting. That's, that's coming from NeuroBoost right there. Hmm. Pretty good stuff. Interesting. Yeah. So, what else do you want to talk about? Uh, so, we talked about uh, funny stuff. Oh, so we got... You're on, we only got five minutes left, John. So we yeah, gotta, yeah, well, we that's why we say, okay, well, we want to make good. sure we get to the good stuff here very, very yeah. quickly. <laughs> yeah, so I got to think of the good stuff. Well, what can I think about right now? I don't know. I would love to, I would love for, uh, to sit down with you and try to write some comedy sometime. Yeah, like so we you, should do something together and say we'll fill up the, the uh, Coliseum here at CN Coliseum and saying that, We'll do a, a funny stuff. Have me do a little bit to start to get the feel of it and saying, oh, this is working. Yeah. So what you got to do, you got to do five minutes. Yeah. That's how it starts. You just want to come up with five minutes of material. Yeah. And then you go up there and you try that out. I think that'd be great. So next year, maybe when you come again, then we can kind of think, be ready for it. Yeah. Right? We could get you on stage for sure. <clears throat> I would love it. Dude, the best part, comedy is the best. It's the only thing that, like, I don't know, it... Again, like talking about like selling stuff, I've never felt bad selling comedy. Like it's, it's a product that it's something that, you know, you don't get anything physical, but you're going to leave with a memory that's going to last a lifetime. And laughing is so, so fun. So let's do that for next year. And then we have to kind of practice. Mm -hmm. And then I get five minutes. Yeah, we'll so, put you on stage and, and, Center next year. And then the other thing that I want to do is I want to give you a, a little present here. Uh, from uh, socks that I want you to wear. I will on, wear those Saturday night. Yeah, and tell them that you got them from me. Okay. You know, so, uh, and, and, and so, and that next year we're going to try to do uh, five minutes I'm of gonna try. my, You're my gonna career do, of the funny stuff. You're going to do five minutes next year. Yes. It'll be very good, man. I, I think everyone should do it. It's like the one thing that's pulled me through. You're talking about depression and stuff and that. Now, I was very depressed. I mean, you don't go around seeking the approval of complete strangers everywhere you go because things are going good, you know. But comedy was always the one thing that pulled me out. I recently, you know, I was talking to a girl and uh, she just messaged me the other day. She was like, hey, I think I need some more space, like, you know, and wants to stop talking. So then right away you're sad, but then I thought of a joke for it. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I was talking to a girl. She said she needs more space. So now I'm looking for a bigger RV. And it's like just writing a dumb joke like that. You're like, ah, great. And you're like, what was I worried about? Like, it's so therapeutic. It's the yeah. best thing I've ever done with my life. And yeah. it's one thing that I can confidently say I will be doing till the day I die. Like, I would never stop doing stand-up comedy. Okay, so we're going to make sure again. Look at my eyeballs. I start talking about them. My eyes get big. I'm excited. Dude, I love it. It's all I want to do every day, John. I like it. So we, we will have CN Coliseum this Saturday, uh, November the 23rd. Yeah. And there are still some seats available. So make sure you go and get your tickets where? Uh, Hungryforlast.com. Okay. And, and get them there. And at the same time, for all those people watching us from around the world, but in particular Canada, Fredericton, you're going to be there on the uh, January the 19th? Yeah, 18th. Yeah, 18th. And we're, we're doing Moncton, we're doing Charlottetown, doing Halifax, going to Newfoundland, doing St. John's. Wow. Yeah, and then we got uh, next week we announce uh, another, like another like 30 show tour coming up through Ontario and Quebec. Website for you? AlexTellsJokes.com. AlexTellsJokes.com. Yeah. Alex. Thank you very much for yeah, being again you. on my show. Thanks for having me again, man. Yeah. It's always fun. It's and, good time. And, uh, you know, the, uh, we'll, we'll get ready already for next year when I'm going to take my debut on being a comedian. Yes. Stand-up comedian. We'll get you up there in a Prince George Cougars jersey. You'll I like it. You'll be on it. stage. You'll have the t-shirt cannon. You'll fire it into the crowd. I like it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks again, uh, Alex. Take care.